Another great meeting. Uh, I think before we start, I would just sit back and say, let's take a moment to think about our friends in Houston and in Texas with what they've been going through. Uh, we live in an area that could be pretty similar. And uh, I would just say we'll start with a moment of silence just thinking about our friends in Texas. Thank you. And Will, if you could tag on to the approaching storms down the Caribbean, too. Yep. About what could be happening there. That's an understatement. That's a great point. Thank you, Rosemary. We do need to be thinking about that. <laughs> but talking about good friends, we have some great friends that we're getting ready to introduce. We got the great Captain Rich Meadows, Oceana, you know, the best air base in the world, <laughs> located in Virginia Beach. Yes. Commanded by Captain Rich Meadows, the man. And it is a pleasure to welcome you here, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, Council. And I uh, would with the uh, Chad Vincelet, the XO, Ray Frenzy, the AQ's manager, and Johnny Lauerbach, our uh, community plan. And we, we thank you, the whole team being over here today. Really did. Thank you. Good. So, ironically, oh, yeah, uh, Les, do I need to. So the world watches gotcha. you. <laughs> Uh, so last week or uh, two weeks ago, we were, were doing our environmental impact or environmental assessment on the conversion between the legacy Hornet to the Super Hornet. Now, ironically, 10 or 11 of the 15 operational squadrons are already Super Hornet squadrons. So we're just talking about a one for one replacement with the remaining squadrons, um, which reminds me. We need to update this slide because that is, in fact, a legacy hornet right there. So we'll do that. But anyway, at that time, Dave said, hey, we were having a, a public meeting, and Dave said, hey, why don't you come on over and address the council to what the community had to, to say when they came. And I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, but also, so we decided, hey, we'll wrap up our biannual state of the, uh, state of the base into it. So uh, that being said, go ahead, Johnny. So just some... Uh, about 17,000 people work on Oceana and Damnick. Um, about 330 aircraft right now, and that fluctuates between 330, 350 aircraft, 15 squadrons, one replacement squadron, meaning that they, uh, they train pilots to come in and fly. And then uh, we have an aggressor squadron, which are, or, uh, they, which for all intents and purposes, bad guys, and they train to bad guy tactics when we go. And then one uh, heavy lift squadron, or they fly at. VR-56, they fly basically Boeing 737s. Um, 64,000 flight operations out of Oceana, okay? And that does not include FCLPs, which we call carrier landing practice. That's all done at Ventress. We don't do any at Oceana. So 64, I just sat down with a uh, pencil and paper before uh, I got in here. But if you divide 365 into that and then the number of months and then days, it comes out to about a flight every 10 minutes, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So it's, it's a busy place. It's a busy place. But I, I want to emphasize that when we fly out of Oceana, we, we're flying to go out to the training area and come back. Um, and then again, all the carrier landing practice is done down at Fentress. Um, and then that's what the, the government brings in between Damnick and uh, between Damnick Annex and Oceana, a little over a billion dollars. Okay, next slide. Oh, some of the challenges. I don't care if we ever talk about that one challenge, but the uh, the fuel spill, 94,000 gallons. It happened in uh, in May. Um, it it ended up. There were a lot of good points that came out of this, um, but it, we had to relocate quite a few families, 54 families, about 180 folks. Um, However, the lesson learned for that is we're, we're way behind the game when it comes to executing money in order to move these folks. They actually didn't get moved until about six days into the, uh, the incident, and by that time it was, it was too late. We'd, we'd, uh, a lot of people were very upset, and uh, we were able to get them into, the, into different hotels in the area. Most of them stayed about two weeks. Some, one or two families stayed a little bit longer. But... Uh, we haven't heard much about the fuel spill in the last month. Uh, we will continue working with uh, de 
Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, and they'll continue to monitor uh, both London Bridge Ditch as well as the, uh, the Wolf Snare area where the majority of the fuel spill was. So, uh, and again, uh, great coordinated action between the Coast Guard, the City of Virginia Beach to include the police, uh, fire department, emergency management, that we all just came together as a unified command and operated very efficiently and effectively. Uh, lessons learned were performed by the Coast Guard as well as uh, Exo Vincelet and Aaron Sutton sat down and, and got together a few more lessons <coughs> learned that we'll just use between us uh, to ensure that we, we smooth that stuff out if we ever have an incident like that again. Okay, next one. So achievements. So for the council, Oceana airspace just extends a, a little bit off over to the beach and then a little, a little bit into the, the city area there. The, that class delta airspace, it's drones don't operate. We can't have drones operating in that. Now, the stuff that happens on the beach, we, we don't have a lot of control over. And I think you're, you as a city is actually, I think, directed not to control the drones from a state, uh, a state aspect. But in Oceana, again, we, we try to get a handle on this. So we, we got together with the police department, with Virginia Beach Police, and set up kind of a memorandum of understanding in order for the police department to fly the drones in Oceana airspace at basically, at basically the drop of a hat. And it proved very well uh, when you had the active shooter situation on the 13th of June. And we were able to implement that MOA or memorandum of agreement. Basically, it was one phone call. The whole thing took maybe two minutes. And, uh, and they had a drone up, and I, I, I'm not sure how effective it was, but I, I, I think you used it, and I think you really were... effective, and it, I'm so glad you all came up with that policy. Yeah, and I, you know, I will say that I've mentioned it in VTCs with, uh, with the Mid-Atlantic uh, installations in region, <laughs> and they really want to take this and use this as a boilerplate for all the installations when it comes to operating drones. And there's an article in the New York Times about it today in military installations, so... Again, I really appreciate that, and I think it's great work uh, by both my team and yours. Thank you. Next slide. So the environmental assessment. Uh, the environmental assessment, the draft uh, came to us at the end of August. Uh, that time shortly after, we decided, since we switched from an environmental impact study to environmental assessment, we didn't have to do any more public meetings, but, but we elected to, to just kind of check the block. We did uh, one... Uh, in Oceana or in Virginia Beach at the, uh, is that Knights of Columbus? Is that right? Yeah, the Knights of Columbus uh, over by Red Wing Park. Um, about 18 people showed up. And, uh, you know, there were some concerns with the noise, as we always, when we have these, even when we, you know, discuss drinking water, we always get, hey, what about the noise? Uh, so that came out. Um, a couple, a couple uh, issues with, uh, was it basically noise? Anyway, it, it, the, the crowd was very cordial, uh, is where I'm going. And it, we had a, some good discussion in there, alleviated some concerns. Oh, I know what it was. It was, what can we do uh, as a homeowner to help soundproof our house, knowing that, that this sound isn't going to go away? And our public affairs officer took those questions and, and responded to those folks. Um, there are some construction things that, that, you, that can be done. But anyway, all in all, it, it worked out very well, and I, I think people uh, people were comfortable. Um, I will sh tell you, uh, they had a the exact same meeting in Washington State up in Woodby Island, the air station up there, and they had 335 people show up at theirs. So uh, it, it, when you have these public meetings for stuff like this, uh, more is not better. So 18 was a lot better than 335. <laughs> Yeah, um, I could kind of relate to that. Yeah, <laughs> I talked about the the one to one replacement there. Ironically, it's a one to one replacement until you get to the FRS. VFA one hundred and six is the training squadron. They have in their squadron about one hundred and fifty aircraft. They have a lot of legacy Hornets in that squadron that they train with right now. That those will eventually go away. So you see about forty less aircraft on the flight line. However, there's going to be no impact. We'll, we'll continue to fly the op tempo that we fly with the operational squadrons. Um, 
And then as, as we went through the environmental assessment, uh, we, we did generate some new noise contours. Um, but, and if you have noise contour questions, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punch you over to Johnny, he's the expert at that. But the, the noise contours that we used at the joint land use study are, are good, there's still good uh, noise contours to have and to follow. Um, so again, any questions on that, feel free to, to send them our way and then uh, Johnny can help me out with that. Next slide, John. Okay, we had two turtle nests over at Damneck. And we had, we literally watched the turtles 24 hours a day, the nests for like three weeks. And they had a bunch of them uh, made it out, I guess. I don't know how many of them lived. Exo's not too optimistic about that. Go ahead. <laughs> so the runway, runway construction project and the lighting project, those continue. Uh, we're almost done with the runway. The lighting project uh, will be done in 2019. Overall, they're, they're about $100 million repair and upgrade to the airfield. Uh, the solar array farm, if, if you're going down uh, Damneck Avenue and you look over to the left when you go into the base, it's, it's quite an operation. Uh, I was over there about three weeks ago and Dominion Power gave us a dog and pony and there were, they're gonna put up 81,000 uh, actual solar panels in the entire area. Um, we don't see any of that power per se right off the bat, uh, that power will go to Dominion slash Virginia Beach. Uh, we do see an in-kind in some of the infrastructure that's run back to the base, meaning if the base is old and they don't have, if we, if we lose power on the, on the base, they don't flip a breaker, we have to fix some stuff on the base. Now with the new infrastructure, they'll flip a switch and we'll be able to get power back. So we're, we're excited for that. Um, we're being close with AQs uh, and the REPI, the inner, uh, inner traffic facility. Again, looking to wrap that up and have, have you guys, or have the road extend across there to, to get folks in there. And we continue with the integrated training. Just had the airfield mishap drill three weeks ago uh, and just worked out great. A lot of volunteers from Virginia Beach, uh, along with the police and fire. Sentara set up, they set up an entire hospital right outside the fire station. So <coughs> the, uh, good collaboration and, uh, and good, good training that we get, and I think you all get that too. So. Next slide. And finally, the air show 15th and 16th, 16th and 17th of September. This should be honoring the home front. We're looking forward to it. Um, and then on the 15th, the STEM event, that's uh, every fifth grader in Virginia Beach uh, and about 3,000 chaperones. <laughs> it was. It's a sight I, to see. It, I say this in general. It was it was fun last year, not as fun this year. But it it's it's going to be a great event, and I'm ex I'm really excited. I, I've talked to uh, Dr. Spence uh, multiple times, and uh, it's just it's a neat event, and and I hope we can keep it going. You're bringing some kids from Chesapeake too, aren't you? From we're bringing, uh, yeah. How many? Three hundred. Three hundred. Three hundred. Good. 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 Okay. Yeah, so it'll be good. They're well, coming, they'll be there in the morning, so they're time. Great. Great. But yeah, we're really looking forward to that event. And we hopefully ironed out any kinks we had last year. Last year went extremely well, but uh, this year hopefully goes better, getting people off the base. And next slide. Okay, next year's 75th anniversary of Oceana. We'll, uh, wow. We're in the kind of the working with Mary Ellen Baldwin over at Navy League to try to come up with some, some good events or one or two like really knock it out of the park type events. Uh, and some ideas right now, maybe a gala or like a, a formal event in one of the hangars with some, um, for lack of a better phrase, some famous people come in to, uh, to enjoy with us. It'll definitely be part of the air show, uh, the 75th anniversary. Um, and then in the spring of next year, we'll have the French Navy will be in town with that aircraft right there, the Rafale. There, their only aircraft carrier, the Charles de Gaulle, will be going into the, the yards, which are, they're gonna go do some work on it for about a year. They wanna make sure that their, their skills don't atrophy, so they'll come over, they'll come over fly with us, um, both at Oceana, Fentress, and then they'll go out to the ship after about two weeks uh, practice, and they'll go out to George Washington, I believe, and they'll spend about three weeks out there. So we're looking forward to having them as well. They'll probably stay on the base, but I, I think we're still working that out. I, I think there's probably a good chance that they'll be in a lot of the hotels as well. So. Next slide. Thanks, and then give me one more 
the backup time. <coughs> so I, I briefed you on this uh, six, seven months ago. So the bar this is all the projects we have going on. The barracks are completed, or the barracks renovation is complete over at Oceana. Uh, ironically, those buildings are really old. Some of the, the barracks that we restored, we now have a, a building that was built in 1954 that's really not in good shape, but it's a barracks. So we're, we're continuing to modernize these, but we get to a point where it's better just tear it down and build a new one rather than continue to modernize these. But we'll, we'll, we'll work that. I told you about the airfield and the, the runway and the lighting project. The hangar repairs are ongoing. NEXTCOM headquarters is almost complete. Um, and that's there off Virginia Beach Boulevard. Uh, the aerial target facility has not started yet, but uh, they are ready to go with that, as well as the maritime surveillance facility located on the south side. And then uh, about $18 million for, to uh, refurbish the reserve center. Well, thank you, Captain. Now, is there any questions or comments from council? We uh, sincerely want to thank you for the good partnership, Rich, that we have here. Uh, I, I also want to thank you and everyone that's over at Oceana, well, anyone serving the military right now, because it's not the easiest of times with the finances. And I've seen it firsthand by going over these bases and seeing the condition of some of the stuff there. And it, to me, it's inexcusable, but I pray that, you know, money will come to fix some of these things. I'd also sit back and say to council that there are written um, much that my wife likes about the mayor's job except one thing, uh, and she really loves the fact that we've made so many friends in the military. And Rich is just another fine example of that. You know, uh, these are just the best people serving our country, great people, and I'm happy to say they've become great friends over the years. So we appreciate everything you do, and we're so glad to have had you here today. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Thanks, Council. Good. All right. The legislative package. Where is Robert Mathias? All righty. Shorter, guys. Much oh. Shorter. Okay. Mr. Mayor, members of Brian. council, uh, you received the draft legislative agenda for 2018 in your package on Friday. I'm going to go over it today very quickly um, because there's not, thankfully, not a lot of new additions this year. Uh, as you know, we put the package together based on input from council, the departments, and your boards and commissions. And uh, this year, as we've done for the past number of years, we have the package split into two parts. Uh, basically, your long-term <laughs> policy positions, positions you've voted on and had in your package previously, and new items. Um, and so, uh, number one... Uh, post Labor Day opening for schools. I don't need to go into great length on this one. There was an interesting article in the paper over last week about Maryland and how Ocean City has had just a uh, complete renaissance in their business the end of August since the governor mandated that they open their schools post Labor Day. Uh, so I think that's uh, we'll be able to get some great information about how their sales have gone up the last couple of weeks of uh, August, uh, first week of September, because uh, we'll have to fight that fight again uh, this coming year in the General Assembly. Uh, moratorium of uranium mining. Uh, we don't expect there'll be any push for that this year. I know the mayor has uh, reached out to both of the candidates for governor uh, to make sure they were on the right side of this issue. And they uh, and they are. <laughs> Increased funding for mental health care, that also is a long-term position of the council, and the uh, Human Rights Commission has also been supporting that uh, very strongly. Uh, voting rights, um, basically this is for uh, no excuse early voting. Uh, council's had this in the package for a number of years. It's supported by the Human Rights Commission, uh, and it's an item that uh, has received very good support from our delegation. Uh, unfortunately, the issue usually dies in a House uh, subcommittee without a vote on it. Uh, there was, uh, and you'll probably be hearing later, about council supporting a independent redistricting commission. Um, our delegation has been very supportive of that also. Uh, however, uh, I don't think there'll be any action in the 2018 session for two things. Number one, the even year, first year, the biennium is not the year that uh, 
constitutional amendments are accepted, they usually have to come in the second year of the biennium. There's a intervening election, and then they have to be voted on again. And also, the Supreme Court has uh, this issue in front of it for its <coughs> upcoming term in October, um, specifically redistricting Virginia, whether it was done uh, for political reasons uh, as opposed to other reasons. The General Assembly is usually remiss to take on items that are before the court, especially the Supreme Court. Next page, please, Brandy. Uh, solution to coastal flooding, regional greenhouse gas in initiative. This is regging. This is basically a carbon trading uh, program. Uh, Delegate Bella Nuevo has been a big sponsor of this. Um, it could mean perhaps $300 million a year to Virginia. Uh, it's basically a, a carbon trading program. It's been used quite uh, well in the Northeast, and it has not increased utility rates. Uh, Menhaden fishing regulation. Uh, Again, this was the council's package last year. Uh, it's very much supported by our delegation, uh, especially Delegate Knight. Uh, governor's cabinet level for resiliency officer for recurrent flooding. Uh, Councilmember Wood is on the uh, Delegate Stolle uh, run uh, commission on recurrent flooding. And uh, we've been pushing very hard on this. Uh, the mayor wrote a letter to the governor asking him to put this in his budget, and we're hopeful he does. Uh, that will uh, ease a lot of the uh, problem. Uh, basically, they could consolidate uh, where this issue is looked at in a number of other secretariats into one secretariat that could have a, a view of this issue. And this is obviously with uh, Houston and perhaps Florida later this uh, week, uh, a very important issue for us. Uh, animal cruelty, uh, this was in your package last year. Uh, Councilman uh, Member uh, Wood was the, the, the patron. Uh, this is basically uh, under Virginia law right now, you can all but kill an animal, and it's still a misdemeanor. It's only after you kill a, a pet, a dog, or a cat pet. Uh, and uh, Senator DeStuff has again um, said he will uh, champion this issue. And this year, rather than amending uh, some existing code, we're going to add a new code section. It will make it, uh, I think, easier to get through uh, scrutiny in the General Assembly. Last year, we did quite well, except there was a nominal $50,000 cost attributed to it because every time you increase uh, code violations, you have to finance it. And uh, we didn't have that money available, but we will this year, I think, uh, uh, pretty for surely. Uh, next one, please. Uh, certificate of Public Need, uh, again, this is issue that will be front of the General Assembly again this year, um, and uh, Council has been supportive of maintaining the Certificate of Public Need as it now stands. And the expansion of the Virginia Human Rights Act, again, this has been in Council's package for a number of years, um, and it's basically uh, right now this is handled by an executive order uh, from the governor, um, but this would uh, prohibit at the state level the same kind of protections we have here at the local level that you cannot be discriminated against for uh, your uh, sexual orientation, religion, gender, et cetera. And uh, we did have uh, two other requests, well, one new request and uh, one past request. In the last several years, you all have supported the expansion of Medicaid. We made a conscious decision this year not to include it in the package just because of the uncertainty of the uh, uh, ACA, uh, Obamacare, because uh, we don't know what's going to happen to that, and that obviously will drive what happens with Medicaid expansion. There was also a request from the Human Rights Commission uh, that we include an item that would um, give driver's license to undocumented immigrants. Uh, we did not include that in the package. Uh, we were unable to get a council patron for it. Uh, new items. Next page, please. Okay, new initiatives. Uh, Mr. Moss um, did his homework, as always, and uh, did a deep dive into the Eastern Virginia Groundwater Management Area Act, and it had a recommendation in there that the cost to uh, administer this act, which affects all of Virginia, not just Eastern Virginia, but all of Virginia, and certainly everything east of the fall line, where about 65% of the taxes to the Commonwealth are generated, uh, to manage this program rather than it coming out of the general fund, 
there was a suggestion that uh, fees be in place for everybody in the Eastern Virginia management area. Mr. Moss uh, rightly said that this is not the way to go. And so while we uh, support the goals of the Eastern Virginia management uh, water, uh, water management area, uh, we don't support uh, us having to pay for it except through the general fund where all of Virginia gets the impact, uh, the, the benefit of this, all of Virginia should pay for it. Mr. Moss, I hope I captured your I thoughts. Great, thank you. Uh, floor on the regional gas tax for Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission. As you all know, during the General Assembly in 2013, House Bill 2313 was passed, and it raised uh, some taxes, including uh, changing the gas tax to a percentage, but it put a floor on the gas tax statewide, and it was the wholesale price of gas the week of February 13th of 2013. Uh, the General Assembly, and this has been told to me repeatedly through an oversight, not through any overt action, did not include the Hampton Roads Transportation Accountability Commission or the Northern Virginia uh, Transportation Accountability Commission in the floor. So we're now losing about $20 million a year in revenue that we expected to get through House Bill 2313. So we're up to about $60 million, $80 million in lost revenue now, and as long as gas prices stay low, that loss will continue to go. As you know, we have uh, over $10 billion worth of projects, and uh, $20 million a year would allow us, HR Tech, to do the debt service on about $250 million worth of debt. And we would very quickly be able to move these projects uh, forward more quickly and also cut down on the cost of inflation. Although inflation is fairly low, construction inflation is still running about 5%. And uh, very quickly, when you have a billion dollars worth of projects, the inflation is eating into your revenue. So what we've requested is that the uh, regions, the two regions, Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads, have the same gas tax floor as the state. And number three, um, this is a uh, do us no harm uh, <laughs> issue right now. Uh, during the 2017 session of the General Assembly, there was legislation introduced in the House that would greatly prohibit the great work that's been done uh, through the leadership of Mr. Davenport and the rest of the region and across the state in uh, the provision of uh, broadband cable. Um, we, uh, you all have seen many uh, uh, presentations on this, and we're saving five to eight million dollars a year by providing this service ourselves, even though we paid the uh, uh, monopolistic uh, local provider to provide the uh, infrastructure. Uh, we are saving money by doing it ourselves in-house. In um, and uh, also there was an initiative at the Senate level to greatly prohibit uh, or limit how we could manage cellular uh, facilities, cellular, uh, uh, whether it's 5G or the existing uh, uh, generation of cell networks. And uh, basically the bill that was introduced in the Senate would have taken away almost all the authority uh, that local governments have to manage these type of uh, facilities. Uh, the Federal Communication Commission is looking at this very strongly. They have some draft regulations out there that we hope don't go anywhere, but they would basically take all the power away from local governments anyway. So what we're asking here is do no harm to local governments on uh, prohibiting what we're currently doing on broadband cable and do no harm on what we're doing with uh, uh, managing uh, fifth generation or, or the current generation of wireless communications. We're not going to stand in the way of these uh, revenue, excuse me, of these uh, resources going forward, technologies going forward, but don't take uh, away our ability to manage what happens in a right of way on buildings, et cetera. So, uh, Mr. Davenport, did I get that for you? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Mayor, that's... We only have three new items this year. Very good. Uh, we do have a question, Jim Wood. Yeah. <clears throat> Going back to the uh, Menhaden thing, Bob. Yes, sir. Th is that still not regulated by the MRC? It's still it is still not regulated. It's the only fishery in the Commonwealth that's not regulated by VMRC. And what we're asking is that VMRC given the uh, ability to regulate it. So, but that's what we've been asking for. for yes, sir. So Delegate Knight's had that bill in for a number of years now. Is there any reason to expect that it's going to be successful? Uh, I always hope for the best that uh, people see the light, but it's going to be an uphill battle. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, John. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I so said that just causes a problem in my district because 
people go out on it's the beach and there's a million dead fish. And it's, it's a mess. Exactly. They're supposed to, uh, they have a gentleman's it's agreement there, that they're supposed been to say like three miles offshore uh, where the chance of the fish washing up on the beach would be lessened. Uh, but anybody that goes down the ocean front you during the right season out there can out there. just throw a rock and hit the boats almost. John Moss. Two things. First, I applaud the shorter list. The shorter list is more effective, so I think that's great. And does 13 still preserve our ability, if we wanted to, to, like, have a <coughs> Wi-Fi zone, say, along the the railroad track if we made it into a bike path that we could install public yes, Wi-Fi for use by the public on public property? Yes, sir. What we're trying to do is to um, from that. yeah, is to not lose any ground from what we currently have, and I think we currently have the authority to do that. All so right, thank you very much. Th this is do us no harm. L Lewis Jones. Uh, Bob, the issue that I discussed with you just a few minutes ago. Yes, sir. If that requires... Uh, uh, legislative action I might want to add yes sir um, you're um, you have the calendar of the schedule for adoption we're going to have a public you will have a public hearing in two weeks and uh, then the first meeting in October you would vote on the, the uh, initiatives uh, but obviously anytime between now and when the general assembly starts uh, you can uh, add uh, issues to the package thank you yes John Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This, uh, Bob, reminded me that we don't do federal items on our legislative agenda, but one thing that we have been working through is uh, the recurrent flooding uh, federal program. Uh, and, you know, as we delve deeper into it, we're, we're actually FEMA, our, our region of FEMA is the only one that requires that the contracts be done in the way that made it impossible for us to, to do it. In other words, in all the other regions, at least the ones locally, the, 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 the homeowner is able to contract directly with the contractor. and administratively we're forced to do it uh, so that we're actually the, the contracting entity so uh, so we've been when looking to to try and make that change so that it would be consistent with mm -hmm. the other uh, FEMA regions and I, I know it won't be in this packet but I wanted the council to be aware that, that we are kind of working towards that and there may be something that, that we bring back forward to everybody to get some help and John Moss I would I would recommend highly that the folks take advantage of the new executive order that the president put out relative to revamping infrastructure projects that's fairly broad and I'd, I'd get over I don't know the appropriate principal deputy Mulcavy is over at office of management and budget but I would certainly get on his uh, calendar and <coughs> tell him what you want to accomplish because certainly all my indications are from people that I know that this is an administration that's looking for opportunities to uh, to put the past bureaucratic processes behind and that extends to flood control projects many things matter of fact I'll be talking about council concerns we really need to look at that executive order and exploit it to its maximum ability uh, they're looking for places where there's places to improve and while maybe the middle bureaucrats may not be as eager people at senior leadership are looking for opportunities but they have to know that the opportunities exist thank you any other questions or comments Thank you, Bob. Thank you all Sounds very much. Like if you have any uh, additions, please let me know. Thank you. Princess Anne Plaza, Windsor Woods, and the Lakes Drainage Area. I will give this to you, Mr. City Manager. I appreciate that, Ms. <clears throat> Mayor Sessoms, uh, members of council. Uh, continuing on with our, uh, our uh, explanation of projects in the works and uh, efforts to combat public enemy number one. Today we will discuss a, a pretty integral uh, internal uh, stormwater system that we have in our city that connects Windsor Woods, the plaza, and the lakes. Uh, they were, of course, as everyone knows, seriously affected by Hurricane Matthew and the uh, 14 inches of rain that we had as a result of that in the inner bowl of our city. And so we have our city engineer, John Fowler, here today to walk us through that. John, thanks for being here. John, glad to have you. Thank you. Well, Mayor Sessoms, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here again for this briefing on three of our largest and arguably most important flood, flood relief projects. That's Princess Anne Plaza, Windsor Woods, and the Lakes. I'll be giving the, the introduction um, and introducing some of the key project team members. After that, Tony Alger and Fred Muncie will give the main presentation. Of course, we all recall only too well about a year ago, Hurricane Matthew dumped about 13 inches of rain on these three 
neighborhoods. Now, under normal circumstances, that would have been a problem, but it was far from normal circumstances. About two and a half weeks before Tropical Storm Julia had also dumped about 13 inches of rain. <laughs> and about two and a half weeks before that, Tropical Storm, Storm Hermine, I believe it was, dumped four or five. Now, what that meant was that when Matthew came with his 13 inches, which fell in less than a day, the lakes and the ponds were pretty well full, the soil was saturated, and the downstream waters were running high. So, in effect, there was nowhere for that 13 inches to go, and these three neighborhoods really suffered on account of that. Uh, council stepped up, and uh, in the... Um, Current CIP provided $42 million worth of funding in the six-year CIP to start tackling that problem. Staff, I believe we've stepped up. We've appointed some of our most senior members to the project team. And I believe we've selected a top-notch firm to be our partner on this project, and that is Michael Baker teamed up with CDM Smith. Now, Michael Baker, they've demonstrated to us in the past that they can take large, multifaceted civil engineering projects and take them through planning, design, permitting, and getting them built. We only have to look at our own Lake Gaston project to see what they can do. CDM Smith, CDM Smith truly are stormwater and stormwater modeling experts. They're currently developing the stormwater models for each of our 31 drainage basins, and those stormwater models will be used for our master planning efforts. Now, currently we have underway the heavy engineering analysis to identify exactly what the problems are and to run a scenario of storms through those analyses and to come up with various alternatives for, for the improvements. The goal then is to package those improvements into a program together with a schedule and implementation uh, needs, bring that back to the council, and we should have that uh, within 10 months. Now, that doesn't mean we're not doing anything else in the meantime. The team is actively looking at early projects that we can do up front that will provide some level of benefit now that are readily identifiable and doable and can be integrated in with the larger program that, that comes out of the engineering analyses. Um, with that, though, I'd like to introduce some of our key members of our team. From Michael Baker, we have Mr. Fred Muncy, PE. Fred has 34 years of engineering experience. Fred's in senior management with Michael Baker. He's been there a long time, but the firm is allowing Fred to manage these three projects. And not only that, but that's all he's going to be doing is managing these three projects. We have Clarence Warnstaff from Michael Baker. Never seen him before. <laughs> you may have never seen him before. After 20 years as the utility director with our city, um, he's here. And uh, Clarence, as we all know, is a fine gentleman, and he'll be handling the public outreach part for Michael Baker. Uh, from our team, we have Mr. Greg Johnson. I will diplomatically say Greg has over 40 years of engineering experience. Uh, Greg is a stormwater and stormwater modeling expert. He truly is. We have Mike Monday down here. Mike is in charge of the stormwater project section in our stormwater engineering center. Mike is, has about 30 years of experience. You have your city engineer. I have 37 years of engineering experience. and. Um, uh, I, I feel confident saying that stormwater and uh, stormwater models are an area that I have some knowledge in, too. And we have Tony Alger. Tony has about 24 years of engineering experience. She leads our stormwater engineering center. And Tony's talent and job is to make sure that all the rest of us are accomplishing what we're supposed to do, when we're supposed to do it, how we're supposed to do it, and to make sure that the, that the resources are there. So with that, I'm going to ask well, to, <laughs> to John and to For the Greg entire Johnson. team, you know, we really Johnson. appreciate y'all being here. Oh, and we will let y'all know we're betting Johnson. on you, too, by the commitment we made to it, okay? I think if you did the average, it's about 36 years' worth of experience yeah. for the people that are on this project. Tony, if you want to come up, we'll turn it over to you. And Tony, we'll be we're available for any there. questions that you may have. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Happy to be here. Um, I'm going to start by discussing uh, the challenges that these neighborhoods are experiencing and why they are, are flooding. Um, 
first and foremost, the elevations in these neighborhoods are extremely low. Um, I've got some slides that are going to show this. Uh, sea level is rising. Sea level uh, has risen one foot in the last 50 years and is expected to rise another foot and a half in the next 50 years. I'm going to talk about the frequency and severity of storms and how they're increasing. I've got a good graphic that demonstrates that. And finally, um, infrastructure in these neighborhoods is over 50 years old. These neighborhoods were constructed in the early days of the city. Princeton Plaza in 1961, the Lakes in 1964 and 1976, and Windsor Woods in 1966. Um, the infrastructure in these neighborhoods is uh, undersized according to today's current standards. Uh, this is a 1949 aerial uh, showing the neighborhoods. Um, what's interesting in this air, uh, photo shows Windsor Woods, Prince Sam Plaza, and the lakes. And these areas were uh, forested back then. Uh, you can see the, the farmland along Holland Road and Linhaven Road. Um, what you could uh, surmise from this photo is that those areas of Windsor Woods, Prince Sam Plaza, and the lakes were probably pretty wet, and that's why they remained forested instead of farmland. Now I'm going to show this is the development that occurred, like I just mentioned, in the early days of the city. Route 44 was constructed in 1967. You see that to the north. Now I'm going to show you the, uh, the streams, the creeks, and the lakes that drain the neighborhoods. And this is the uh, FEMA flood zone map. And as you can see from this photo, um, the majority of the area is in the 100-year floodplain, and that's elevation 7. And finally, these are the homes that were affected by Hurricane Matthew. Now I want to talk about the tidal impacts to these, to these neighborhoods. Uh, to the uh, northwest, we've got Thalia Creek. To the northeast, we've got... London Bridge Creek, and to the south, we've got West Neck Creek. And when tides are running uh, two feet high, you can see the colors show that um, most of the water does stay within the uh, banks of the, um, the canals, the rivers, and the lakes. Up to uh, four foot tide, uh, you can see it's um, coming up to the top of London Bridge Creek. It's flooding some low-lying areas. And then up to six feet, you can see much more uh, flooding in the low-lying areas and some street flooding. And you can see London Bridge Creek has overtopped. Eight feet, major structural flooding. And then 10 feet. This demonstrates basically London Bridge Creek and Thalia Creek are now connected. Now that leads me into sea level rise. As I mentioned, sea level has risen a foot in the last 50 years. These three graphs are from NOAA. Um, since 1927, the uh, gauge at Sewell's Point has shown an increase in sea level rise of 4.61 millimeters per year. At the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel, since 1975, sea level has risen 5.94 millimeters per year. And at Duck, since 1978, the sea level has risen 4.53 millimeters per year. And what this means in the last 50 years, you can see at each one of the gauges, you've got 9 inches increase at Sewell's Point, 11 .5 inches at Chesapeake Braybridge Tunnel, and 8.9 inches at Duck. So when we start to look at some of the um, design alternatives and the infrastructure improvements that we're going to do with these neighborhoods, we need to consider at a minimum one foot sea level rise and probably three foot sea level rise. Now, um, about the future rainfall, I mentioned that the frequency and the number of, of um, storms are, have been increasing dramatically. This chart shows since 1950, uh, the black line represents the actual uh, peaks over threshold at the Norfolk gauge. And between 1950 and 2003, they did a trend line. This, this chart comes from NOAA. Uh, a trend line was developed, and that's the first line at the bottom. Between 1950 and 2016, they updated that trend because they, you can see the storms were increasing based on the actual 
uh, Norfolk gauge peaks over threshold. Now, if we look at 2017, um, the lines to the, the right, the colored lines, represent different model simulations. The green line represents the most accurate information based on the actual peaks over threshold for Norfolk. So if we take that green line and start at 2017, we have a new trend. So basically what we're seeing here is that it's raining harder and more often. Is that Norfolk Gage at the airport? Yes. All right, thank you. So all of that information leads me to what happened last year, as John mentioned, Hurricane Matthew. These photos were actual photos taken during that storm in the neighborhoods of Prince Sam Plaza, the lakes, and Windsor Woods. Hurricane Matthew was an extreme rain event, as John mentioned. Thelia Creek and London Bridge Creek, the water surface elevations were 5.3 feet. At Westnet Creek, it was 7 feet. So if you add 13 inches of rain on top of that in a low-lying area, the water has nowhere to go. So this map um, is showing you the, the elevations of the neighborhood. All of the colored areas are, below, uh, are between um, 8 and 4 feet. I think the uh, most important thing to take away from this slide is that the majority of the neighborhood is below 10 feet. Was the rain event a 500-year <coughs> event, or was the combination of the tidal and the rain a 500-year event? Yeah, no, it was not a tidal event at all. It was just a rain event. 500-year. 500 500-year? Okay. Uh, 500 yes. All right. Thank you. So as John mentioned, City Council responded. You uh, supplied $42 million in the six-year CIP with another $86 million to be programmed beyond that. These are the amounts, the $20 million, the $17 million, and the $2 million that has been um, added to each of these projects in the current CIP. Um, and Public Works stepped up. These projects are moving forward. The budget was approved on May 9th, 2017. The very next day, we had an RFP out for Architectural and Engineering Services. In June 22nd, statements of interest and qualifications were received. July 1, the budget went into effect. And on July 20th, we selected Michael Baker, team with CDM Smith as our engineer. But I do want to discuss that uh, everything that has occurred in this neighborhood is not news to Public Works. We've been working in this neighborhoods, these neighborhoods since 1990. These are some of the completed projects that have been done. Canal number two, Rosemont Road, Windsor Woods drainage improvements, Princess Anne Plaza drainage, stormwater infrastructure rehabilitation, and Bow Creek Rec Center storm drainage improvements. Canal number two was a cost participation project with the Army Corps of Engineers. It diverted stormwater from London Bridge Creek it was completed in 1990 for a total project cost of $55 million. Rosemont Road, Windsor Woods drainage. These were uh, two uh, stormwater detention basins that were constructed. It was completed in 1996, and the total project cost was $1.2 million. Princess Anne Plaza drainage, phase two. These were improvements within the Bow Creek Golf Course. There were two culverts that were replaced at Bow Creek Boulevard and Clubhouse Road, completed in 1998 for a cost of $5.9 million. Stormwater infrastructure rehabilitation. Um, these were multiple projects that were done within the Princess Anne Plaza neighborhood. The uh, improvements included slip lining pipes and replacing pipes. It was completed in 2008 for a cost of $5 million. And finally, Bow Creek Rec Center storm drainage improvements. Uh, these were improvements within the golf course to help um, drainage along Clubhouse Road. It was completed in 2015 for a cost of 600000 So we're currently doing uh, additional projects within these neighborhoods. These next group of projects are dredging projects. They're either under construction now or will be um, by the end of the year. We've got Northgate Ditch. 
Windsor Woods Canal, Windsor Oaks West 1, 2, and 3. Northgate Ditch, this is going to dredge 6,000 linear feet of canal. We're going to remove approximately 3,000 cubic yards of material. Notice to proceed was given in May of 2017. Construction should be complete by January of 2018 for a cost of $2 million. Windsor Woods Canal. This will dredge 4,100 linear feet. Approximately 10,900 cubic yards of material will be removed. Notice to proceed was given in June. Construction will be complete in June of 2018 for a cost of $2 million. Windsor Oaks West Phase 1. This will dredge 1,510 linear feet, removing approximately 4,200 cubic yards of material. Notice to proceed was given in June, with construction being complete hopefully in October. Total project cost, $750,000. Windsor Oaks West 2 will dredge 2,760 linear feet, removing 7,000 cubic yards of material. Notice to proceed was given in July 2017. Construction complete January of 2018 for an estimated cost of $800,000. And Windsor Oaks West Phase 3. This will dredge 2,100 linear feet. Approximately 5,000 material, uh, cubic yards of material will be removed. Notice to proceed hopefully in October of 2017. Construction complete in June of next year for a cost of six hundred thousand. So moving forward, uh, we are going to complete all of these projects um, by the end uh, um, by the end of next year. Ju well, no, we'll be done hopefully by the June of next year. Um, operations is going to keep the infrastructure maintained. That's going to be an ongoing process. Um, Michael Baker is going to help us identify and implement upfront improvements, and those could be portable pumps to draw down Lake Windsor, selected detention system upgrades, and selected collection system upgrades. Uh, Michael Baker is uh, doing our detailed engineering analysis to develop the specific program of flood control measures. For the, um, the purposes of the analysis, we've combined the three neighborhoods since the drainage systems work together. Um, the engineering analysis will identify the needed improvements, identify the cost of those improvements, identify the implementation plan of the improvements, including a phasing plan, identify the environmental permitting required, and finally, design, permit, and construct the identified improvements. And we hope to have this engineering analysis complete by July of next year. And now I want to turn it over to Fred Muncy so he can talk about uh, his company's objectives and their general approach to the project. <coughs> Fred, we're glad to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Mm -hmm. Mayor Sessoms and uh, members of City Council, on behalf of Michael Baker International, we're excited to be a part of this critical project for the city. I've lived in the city for 34 years. I came to the city to work on Virginia Beach projects. So I'm a trusted person that you can rely on to deliver this program, and I hope that was part of the decision-making that uh, Public Works had. Uh, this stormwater program is very multifaceted. It will include numerous projects. It's uh, very complex, um, primarily because it will be implemented in an already developed neighborhood setting. and but also because it involves the combination of tidal flooding plus stormwater flooding. So, and in, in, in low-lying areas. So this is not a neighborhood stormwater project that is just solving periodic flooding of a small area or replacing aging infrastructure. It's much, much more. There are many challenges ahead. Um, we've got the low ground elevations of the roads and buildings. The outfall channels are influenced by tides and sea level rise. Currently, there are undersized stormwater collection systems for today's needs. The high tides are resulting in significant reduction of stormwater capacity in the lakes, the canals, and the streets. And intense storm events are resulting in more frequent flooding and even property damage. But there are some solutions. We understand the complexities associated with flood resiliency in uh, 
projects such as this. Uh, design and construction of large capacity stormwater pumping stations coupled with barriers and tide gates to minimize the influence of tidal flooding are highly likely in these areas. And the design, construction, and operation of these major pumping facilities of the size needed for this program are really a new chapter for the city. These are much larger than what you've implemented to date in any, any part of the city. This effort requires engineers with both depth and knowledge and hands-on experience. The Michael Baker and CDM team bring in-depth design expertise with these large pump stations and tidal barriers. As always, working within uh, waterways, you've got to minimize the environmental impacts. And we've got to build a footprint or design a footprint that is as minimum disturbance to the environment as possible. This will help foster permitting actions in a timely manner. But it also means that we need to have early involvement with all regulatory stakeholders. And it'll be important to identify those regulatory issues and the potential mitigation approaches that are needed to mitigate any environmental impacts. We also recognize that uh, construction in the existing neighborhoods can be quite impacting to the day-to-day -day activities of the city residents. Keeping residents continuously informed, maintaining access, both for public safety and for the residents, as well as keeping a safe, clean work area during construction are critical objectives that we want to uh, meet. In concert with the city leadership, we will help build awareness and advocacy within the community through focused meetings, public outreach, community me meetings, and other media. And in regards to that public outreach and involvement, Mr. Warren's staff will be heavily involved with that from our perspective. There are a number of key program objectives we have in moving forward. We are moving forward with early implementation projects. These are projects that can move forward immediately or in very short order. The city and our team are currently moving forward with many activities with a sense of urgency. As discussed by Tony, canal dredging projects are underway. There's a lot of maintenance and operation work going on with drainage inlets, storm drainage cleaning, and other activities. We're also advancing drainage infrastructure upgrades in areas where we can gain immediate localized benefits from uh, giving flooding relief to, to smaller areas. These early implementation projects will be constructed in parallel with development of the full program prioritization. We're also advancing long lead project development now. Uh, for example, we were determining or trying to determine the optimum location for pump stations and barriers along these creeks. Uh, the regulators certainly have a, a say in that, and it will take time. We know that regulatory permitting and property acquisition are qu critical path items on our schedule and for the program, and both are dependent on fixing the locations of these major hydraulic facilities. Another objective is to keep you and the city residents regularly informed of the program plan and progress through briefings such as this, civic association meetings, uh, Focus public meetings, any media use that we may use. We want the city leadership and the residents to be up to date with the ongoing project activities, including our progress, the uh, active construction efforts, and then responses to any questions or concerns they may have. Our end goals for the Lake, Princess Anne Plaza, and Windsor Woods neighborhoods are implementation of long-term solutions to mitigate the flooding in the project areas as soon as possible. We are rapidly developing the prioritized project sequencing plan and hydraulic analyses. <clears throat> These steps are critical to assure the combined infrastructure is practical, functional, permittable, and approvable. And at the end of the day, this step also helps us assure we are developing cost-effective solutions that are at the right time and in the right order. With that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Clarence to uh, kind of close up our presentation. Clarence? Thank you, Fred. Can we ask a question of you first, Fred? Jim Wood, I think we must ask Fred close up there, please. <coughs> I've got a couple. I can wait until after Clarence. Okay, is done. go ahead, Clarence. Glad, That's to, fine. Have you. Glad Mayor, to see you up there again, sir. Thank you very much. Mayor, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here today. I only have two slides. <laughs> That's unusual, <laughs> from what I remember. <laughs> I've learned over the years. I wanted to talk about some, the team that we put together 
along with past performance that this team and these companies have had with the city of Virginia Beach. I've listed a number of projects that really have been high profile projects for the city. In many cases, this was the first type of project the city had had in those categories. I'm not gonna talk about all five, I'm gonna talk about my favorite project, the Lake Gaston project. Baker, Michael Baker Engineers was retained by the city of Virginia Beach in the early 80s to work on the Gaston project. It was in November 1982, the Virginia Beach City Council authorized the city manager to proceed with the project. Fifteen years later, almost to the exact date, November 97, we had the ribbon cutting ceremony. During those 15 years, the City Council of Virginia Beach made some courageous decisions. They exercised the leadership. They kept the they kept the boat steering forward in light of a lots of obstacles. Likewise, there were a lot of engineering challenges as well. Baker met those challenges and offered to the city innovative engineering solutions and cost-effective solutions. So it was a great team then, and it'll be a great team now. We look forward to working on this project, and we're very excited about it. One last thing about Gaston, January the 1st, just a few months away, you can celebrate 20 years of operation of the Gaston project, a solid public infrastructure project that delivers quality service to this city every day. I want to talk a little bit about the resources necessary for this project. In our meetings with Public Works, we learn they wanted to select a team that had lots of resources, a team that could put, could work simultaneously on numerous projects at the same time. In other words, lots of boots on the ground to get the job done. Additionally, they wanted to make sure that the team they selected had experienced engineers, educated, hands-on experience with large stormwater pumping stations and public infrastructure to block tidal flooding. We put together that team and we were very fortunate that to be been selected. We are excited about it. So, do we have the capacity to do the job? Yes. Do we have a proven team? Yes. Have we demonstrated our accountability to the city in prior decades? Yes. Are we committed? We live here too. We work here. It's our city. We're definitely committed to this project and we will make it successful. I will take a few minutes and talk, we mentioned public outreach earlier. In my 35 years of local government service, I kind of learned the hard way about public outreach. It, is a, it will be a critical part of this program. We need to keep our citizens and our residents informed. But I think the most important element of any public outreach is to listen. To listen to the citizens, identify their concerns, and work to resolve those. So we are excited about this project, and we look forward to working with the Public Works staff and with the City Council. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tony. Thank you, Clarence. Okay, so uh, we'll take questions and hopefully the team okay, can... We'll start with Jim Wood, please. <clears throat> Thanks, and I, and I appreciate the, um, all the detail that you all have provided. Particularly, I was interesting on the 1940s, 71-year-old map that, that it shows that. But... So, so every time we've talked about this, y'all have told us all along that if we have another Matthew, everything we've got planned is not going to be able to completely solve it. But then I kind of saw today the, the, the information from Michael Baker, which gives me a little bit more hope because you're talking about the massive pump stations and things like that. So, so I guess my question is, is are we going to be able to protect homes? And, you know, if, if we have to, if the, if, we don't want anything to flood, but if something has to flood, it should be streets rather than homes. So, 
Are we going to be able to do that with this? That, that's the goal with this project, is to protect homes. So, uh, we, so from a, another incident like Matthew, <laughs> where you've got one storm, then another storm, and then, then a third storm coming in like that, are we going to be able to do that? Well, I, I don't want to say that we can protect from a 500-year storm, because that's what Matthew was, was a 500-year storm. The goal with this project is to minimize flooding to three inches in the roadway. This is These are some of the preliminary goals uh, prior to our or design analysis complete, but three inches at the crown of the roadway, which basically takes it to um, the top of the curb in the streets. And knowing that a lot of the um, elevations in the neighborhood are low, there are some areas that we may need to look at as far as what we need to do in the, the lower areas where that's not gonna work. But the goal is three inches in the street. So when we're talking about these, these big pump stations, are we talking about Pump stations are the size of the ones at the north end or bigger than that? Bigger than that. Bigger than that. Yeah. So th those take up a significant amount of real estate. Exactly. So we're going to have to acquire real estate for these. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the goal right now, that's, what, that's why the engineering analyses are going to take some time. When you're planning a program of projects like this, and, and Mr. Wood, I'll get back to your first question. We like to do things, it's, it's my expression, the bookend method. You have a do-nothing a do nothing alternative. You have, we will identify the solve-everything alternative. And we will identify all things in the middle so that the budgets can be matched with the amount, with the amount of relief that can be feasibly supplied. The thinking now, getting to the pump stations, is that we will need at least three fairly major pump stations. One down by Lake Windsor to drain off towards Dahlia Creek, and probably one on the north end of London Bridge Creek and one on the south end. When you have elevations like seven at, in London Bridge Creek and you have land elevations lower in this neighborhood, you have to pump. And same with, with on the north end. Baker's already been kind of brainstorming how to minimize the footprint of those and the impact of those, but again, that's going to come out of our analysis <coughs> that we're doing now. Like I said, and we'll have a range, you know, from fix everything to, you know, there's always to do, to do nothing alternative. We're kind of taking a sheet from the core of engineers and the way that they approach their projects. They run a series, series of design storms through. They, rate, they identify a range of alternatives, and they present a balanced program that they think kind of blends the best of both. So, and when, when y'all are taking, this is my last question, so, so when y'all are taking a look at, at these capital projects and, and doing the modeling and analysis, I, I assume that you are figuring, determining exactly where the water is coming that is inundating this particular street and this, these particular group of houses. So is, during your modeling and investigation of that, is there a method whereby you could identify a way in which your operations division could install temporary barricades in advance of storms, n knowing that these things are going to be expensive to, to procure and, and hopefully we would never need, but, but perhaps is something that would be considered. I mean, because ultimately, again, if pr protecting the homes is, is the most in, important thing, even if we have to block a road to do it. No, th uh, certainly that's something that we can look at. I mean, I mean, quite frankly, I hadn't thought of that before, but that's certainly something as we identify in the analyses, the areas that flood, are there temporary things that we can be doing? Like down in Asheville Park, we have temporary pumps at Sherwood Lakes. We're going to look at them in, at Lake Windsor. We could look at them saying, in, is, is in you more know isolated is areas, too, right. and see if they would you know, help until we can get the full, the full program. Okay, thank you. I got John Moss and then uh, Barbara. I'd like to go to slide 11, but at least our slide 11, I'm not sure. And uh, <clears throat> is the study we're going to do going to assess how well the improvements we did put in, how they performed relative to what the engineering projection was at the time of their installation? We'll be assessing how well they performed. And we did those drainage projects at Rosemont Road. We had a certain <coughs> expectation of how they would perform. Are we going to look and see if, in fact, they delivered on the planned performance? Uh, m most of those, I mean, we can if, yeah. if, 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 if we want to take the time and, and, and a little bit of expense, but most of those 
we're not so much system-wide fix the whole problem as isolated problem-solving project. Well, I'm only, because as you read this and as it was conveyed in the context of the conversation, you would think they were more significant than what you just now conveyed them. So now these were like patches on a flat tire. I got that. So I just want to make sure I understood the context of that. Okay, now I do. Uh, if we could, if I went through and I want to know, when we remove cubic yards of drainage material, are we getting cubic yard per cubic yard of water storage? No, this is returning those canals back to their original capacity. Okay, so, so, so I guess that's another good important because I was thinking maybe I'm gaining something. But in fact, that since we didn't have this during the Matthew storm, so we are gaining back what we lost. And the reason why I'm asking, because if you look, there's roughly about 200 to 205 gallons on a cubic yard you're roughly moving 30,100 cubic yards. So that's about, I think I calculated, it's about 6 million gallons of water. Mm -hmm. So if you looked at how we performed under Matthew, and if you had 6 million gallons more of storage from which runoff, how would that have affected the, the flood that you saw? Maybe none, maybe zero, but I think that'd be interesting to see if you had that 6 million of storage because people need to realize an inch of rain on an acre is 27,000 gallons. Mm -hmm. So 13 inches is 600 and something thousand gallons of water on a single acre of property. That's a lot of water. So I, I, it gives people an idea of what we're talking about. So I think it would be interesting to know if we, if, when we buy that back, would it, it might not meant everybody's home didn't flood, but it may be some areas where marginal, that it could have made a difference. It'd be interesting. I think the model would tell us that, I was going right? to say, we're doing the modeling now, so. And so when you look at these, and I like the idea about, because I've seen some ideas about protecting houses, the things you fill up with water at the bottom that form the occlusive seal with the ground that they put around people's homes even. Yeah, but they're very expensive, and that's why I say it would be a capital expense. Right, but I meant was, but if you look at the implication of, $180 billion of damage in Texas, maybe it's who has to partner with us, as you say, Mr. Mayor, to help us get there, but it may be cheap insurance relative to the, to the loss, and I think that's the, the, the key, and as we're repaving streets, well, I guess we have the option to look at is, as that happens, to lower the streets, to, if you can, where you can't, that's something you're all looking at, is where it makes sense, and you can lower the streets to create more capacity in the streets. We'll be looking at lots of different that's alternatives. That's especially true where houses are at the street. And many of those, as we see, are there. And I'm not saying do it right away, but as you're doing other things, if you had to replace sewer pipes, had to replace water pipes for the time came, that's just something to look at. I hope we will look at that. And I am very pleased to hear you aggressive, because I think we can do a lot of this stuff faster than, than 15 years. And everything I heard in this presentation suggests that that is possible. Maybe not six, but maybe 10. But uh, I do appreciate that you have uh, appeared to have the competence to push these at a much faster pace. Mm -hmm. I do appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Barbara. I, I really do appreciate the overall context of, of where you are going and so forth. But going back to the initial uh, discussion with Windsor Woods and Prince Sam Plaza and the lakes, I, I, I get the Failure Creek and the London Bridge Creek, but you're more talking about Westnet Creek, too. Mm -hmm. Now, is that just because it's connected? But at what point is Westnet Creek the southern flowing and which part of it is it actually comes up here from the south yeah yeah, yeah no, that's uh, what has me confused mm -hmm. uh, uh, when is it when does it stop being west neck creek i mean i know it connects all the way to shore drive but we don't consider talk, talk about it as being west neck creek and where where are the different dynamics when does it start flowing south when does it start going the other it way it varies a little bit high? but but more or less at, at damn neck road but 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 it varies On depending upon road, storm right. but but you're absolutely right mrs henley i mean that's part of what you have to look at. That's why, you know, as much as we want to just jump out there and solve things, if you're going to build a big pump station on that end, you got to make sure you're not just transferring the problem on downstream to somebody else. So that, you know, has to be looked at hard. Well, you know, that's my concern because as we talk about the southern part of the city and, you know, where the, where the water goes at various developments that we're talking about, you know, West Neck Creek just keeps popping up like we've got, you know, it's, it's no problem. But... You know, it's it's pretty dynamic, and I, I just am concerned about 
how we, you know, make sure we're looking at everything. We, we will yeah. make sure we look at that. And I mean, there's a lot of ideas floating around too that we haven't shared. Like, you know, we may have a lot more water hazards on Bow Creek Golf Course before we're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you have to store water. So, well, thanks. That's a good idea. Shannon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I noticed on page 23 you've got timelines for um, projects going forward, et cetera. If you move forward to the next page, they're obvious. No. The other forward. <laughs> uh, 24. There you go. We don't have any kind of estimated time frames there. I know working through the budget this past season, we, we put in what we could and we, we estimated on what we thought it might cost, not knowing what the engineering plans are. And uh, knowing that we're going to start working on our budget in March again for next year is what is the the time frame that we think we may have the analysis kind of complete or have some kind of preliminary number so we can be um, fiduciarily responsible when we come to budgeting this year. Our goal is to have this analysis complete by July of next year. But but I think we'll start having some answers. Yep. Some things are going to come out before that, too, for, for budgeting purposes. I mean, that would yeah. certainly – I mean, I'm not saying hurry up because we've got to do it right, but what I'm saying is it would be nice to know a little bit of, you know, 70 percent of what we're dealing with so that we can be smart when we are putting those numbers on paper next yeah, year. Yeah, and if um, – the previous slide did show the numbers that, that were already included in the six-year. Right, um, right. So, but I, I think we'll have some of the – some of the bigger – improvements especially will yeah. have have a good idea of what we're doing we might not know every 15 inch pipe it needs to be an 18 inch pipe by march but we'll know the big stuff that we have to do and i know that um we obviously don't know what we're dealing with you know it's going to be opening pandora's box i'm afraid when we start digging and and, and finding out what's under the ground from 50 years ago um but will we kind of have some kind of an estimate maybe when this is complete of an estimated time frame, that maybe it is closer to the 10 years than the 15, et cetera, will we know a little bit more of that then, or is that when we open Pandora's box that we figure that out? <laughs> no, I think that that's part of what we're doing now yeah. is to come up with the program of improvements and the and the implementation plan. Okay. Thank you. John, you have something else? I I, want, I'm sorry. I want to back, because I'm right I where you Susan is. But I meant this. But I mentioned <laughs> before, I would. I know we talk about all these permitting things are in the critical path. I think the time could not be better, Mr. City Manager, to be engaging the people at state and at the federal level as we go along here. I would suspect that we would get ability to move at a quicker pace than what has traditionally been the, the case. And to the extent that that's six months in our timeline and we can do it in parallel and it's three so we can create margin wherever we can but i couldn't think of a better climate to be knocking on someone's door saying would you rather have a fix this problem or have an emergency relief program you know which is cheaper you know look at this thing have to have the right science understand all that but we're talking about the time they take once they they get it and all that you know digestive process you know Maybe they can get the yes, too. And uh, I'm just saying I think that the timing and the climate's right. Jessica? I just had a question on well, we're on the slide. For about Lake Windsor, do we have any greater details on what we're looking at for Wake Lake Windsor? And if not, do we are we planning on having another brief about the specifics of what we're going to be looking at? Uh, we'll be briefing you again once the analysis is complete. We'll be back. Actually, we'll probably be back. We're doing another uh, uh presentation later this month on the whole stormwater program um, and then we'll be back to uh, brief you again when we have the analysis complete thank you mm -hmm. very good any other questions or comments I would just sit back and say uh, thank you all for your presentation I would I think we've all seen some great work done over the years that it's made differences but I still and I, I correct me if I'm wrong I don't want the public to ever think though that even with all this money and this excellent engineering going on, a bad hurricane comes in here or something along those lines, water can still go in the houses. And I, I just, I, I think we must keep that point clear that regardless, and we're making every effort to address stormwater to the best of our ability by having great people working and funding it, still a major storm, guess what? You spend all the money in the world, it doesn't do one bit of good for that storm. But I do thank you all very, very much. Mayor, you're absolutely correct. We built Rosemont Forest on your direction and your um, endorsement 
Mr. Dyer and your district, and uh, for about 16 weather events, it held the, held the test. But in Matthew, it was overcome. We had to shut it off because our lake was full, our ditches were full, and uh, we were just cycling water, and it wasn't going to actually affect anything. So all engineering solutions have some maximum capability, uh, solution capability that they deliver, and at certain points you reach that. Correct. Barbara? Just, just a thought, and I, I guess maybe uh, light bulbs go on at different times, and mine was just slow. Uh, <laughs> But I, I guess with Clarence talking about the comparable with the Lake Gaston project, our, our stormwater, sea level rise, whatever we're calling all of this together is sort of comparable to our water project in that we're, we're doing an all-encompassing, not just individual projects. And, and with all of this analysis that we're doing, because they do... And I think maybe that's where we have not done a, a, as good a job because we have piecemealed things, but things really need to be in the overall scope of things. A system. A system, a total system. And so this is the way we present it to the, to the public so that we, we don't have people thinking in terms of, well, this neighborhood's getting this and that neighborhood's getting the other, but that we're, we're doing the whole system. Is that... Yeah, I, no, I, I, I definitely say that. And, and in the sea level rise presentation given a couple months back, um, the preliminary identification of, you know, there were about six areas that looked like they were going to be particularly affected by sea level rise, and, and this was one of those six. So I think that it is being, being integrated and looked at as a system. We sure do. Thank you all. Have a good rest of the day. All right, we're now going to go to, for a SIPS update. Where's Philip short term Davenport? Right here, sir. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Phil, <coughs> since you made your announcement, it's the first time you've been up here in front of us, I'm going to tell you we're going to miss you. You've done a heck of a Jake, great job for this city. Well, I so don't screw up this last one. Well, I. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, and, and I was comp contemplating my decision yesterday as I was sitting on the beach drinking a cold beer and thinking, gosh, would it be nicer to be sitting in the office? <laughs> and I kind of said, no, I don't think so. Well, well, we're happy for you. Well, thank you. Kind of jealous. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to be very quick um, and give you, a, give you a little bit of a... A little bit of background first on how we got to where we are, and, and quite frankly, we are in a very, very good place right now, I believe, with SIPSA. Looking at the background, our, our current agreement with SIPSA, which expires January 24th, 2018, we have a tipping fee of $125 per ton. And... A lot of that is because we have a lot of debt at SIPSA that will be paid off by January 24th. So that's going to buy down the tipping fee quite a bit. As we go forward, we have what SIPSA is referring to as SIPSA 2.0, and that's January 25th, 2018, and beyond. And we signed, we, Virginia Beach, signed on to that agreement in May of 2016. And it has a nine-year lifespan on it. So that agreement expires June 30th of 2027. When we signed on to that, we expected, we all expected, that the tipping fee going forward starting January 25th would be $65 per ton or less. In discussions with City Council, there were several conditions that we, the staff, and City Council all thought were very important for <coughs> Virginia Beach in re-signing up with SIPSA. One was that we have a long-term solution, at least a 50-year solution. We knew that if we could get SIPSA to try to get a CUP with 
the city of Suffolk to expand into landfill cell seven, that we would have at least that much capacity. That has been done. We we have that that CUP now approved by the city of Suffolk. At the staff level, we always thought that the best option going forward would be to landfill all of the sips of waste. I still believe that to be true, and that's where we're probably going to end up. Um, again, resolving the issues with, with cell seven and the city of Suffolk and, and SIPSA have come to that agreement and the CUP has been approved by the Suffolk Council. As part of that, Suffolk wanted to have what they call a good neighbor agreement. They're going to, they're going to be paying the same tipping fee as all of the other members of SEPSA, which is different than today. Today, they don't pay a tipping fee, but they get free disposal at their landfill and they host the landfill. So that's kind of the, the trade-off there. Going forward, they will pay the same tipping fee as the rest of us, but the good neighbor agreement means that for every ton that goes into that landfill, Suffolk will get $4 per ton. So if you look at the amount of waste that the SIPs of municipalities put into the, the landfill, it's about 375,000 tons per year. And if you look at that, there their agreement would pay them about $1.5 million from the municipalities. There will be additional waste that goes in from um, commercial haulers, private haulers. They will still pay that same $4 tipping fee. And we, we thought we needed to accommodate in some fashion the commercial waste. SIPSA was going along a path where they were not planning to accommodate commercial waste. That's a big part of what we have in Virginia Beach. We thought it was important, and we now have some accommodation through the SIPSA agreement for that. And with that, commercial haulers will be able to use the SIPSA transfer stations. They will then pay SIPSA for transporting waste and they will have a tipping fee that comes off of that. That exact number is still to be determined, but it will be more than cost beneficial. So looking, going back in time just a little bit, um, back in 2015, there were a lot of people in the SIPSA community who thought they did not want to put things in the landfill. They wanted to come up with a different solution. An RFP went out on the street back in 2015, and there were three responses from Repower South, Republic Service, and Wheeler Brader. And if you take the, the cost that they submitted in their bid and then add to that the amount of fees that SIPSA has on top of that for the transfer stations for hauling waste, and for other parts of the SIPSA business. The numbers you see up here, the numbers you see up here were the, where am I there? I'm sorry. The numbers you see up here were the, the proposed tipping fees back in 2015. And it was um, The city of Virginia Beach asked SIPSA to put in an extra calculation for what would it cost if they just landfilled everything? And that's the 5737 that you see. The exercise. Based on these numbers, SIPSA made the decision to enter into a contract with Repower South because that was the lowest cost provider at the time. Um, a lot of us were pretty skeptical about that. And we, we weren't sure that Repower was actually going to be able to produce what they said they could. Um, nonetheless, we entered into a contract. We, SIPSA, entered into a contract with Repower South May 25th, 2016. There were three deliverables that they were required to meet 
by January of 2017. One was that they have all of their required permits in place. Another, that they have an offtake agreement for all of the pellets that they were going to produce to, to burn in, in power plants. And another was financing. The offtake agreement that they had proposed all along was going to be with Virginia Power, and that seemed to be a little bit shaky from the beginning. Within the last month or so, it completely fell apart, and at the last meeting of SIPSA, the people from Repower South said, we don't have an agreement with Virginia Power, we're not going to get one, we're looking for some other places and it was going to be far less pellets, and they were going to recover their costs through more of a recycling than a, a, a making pellets type program. Um, the same time, their, their ability to get financing was falling apart. They had gone completely to non-rated financing. Um, they were having trouble coming up with the amount of capital that they needed. So, you know, this is not something you guys haven't heard before with other people. So, you know, we know how this works. Thanks, Bill. Um, <laughs> so the, the bottom line is Repower was unable to provide any of their deliverables. And at the last meeting oh, in August, the SIPSA board voted to terminate the contract. That termination letter was issued in August, on August 23rd, and that puts us now back to the SIPSA landfill as our option. Um, again, this is where we in Virginia Beach thought we would always end up and kind of hoped we would end up there. So I, I showed you some budget numbers earlier that back in 2015, SIPSA had indicated it would be somewhere around 5737 if we were to just landfill everything. But here we are a couple of years later, and at, at this point, we don't have an exact number, but we're thinking the tipping fee will turn out to be somewhere in the $58, $59 range. So... Looking at, at 59 as a, a reasonable budget number, um, the way we budgeted in the FY18 year for the first seven months, <clears throat> $125 per ton, and then for the last five months of the year, 65 If on January 25th, 2018, we go down to $59 a ton, we have a, a potential savings of about $345,000. That's based on the Virginia Beach waste stream of about 138,000 tons. In FY19, if we continued with 138,000 tons and, and we had continued at $65 per ton, that would have been $8.9 million at $59. A ton, we have a potential savings of about eight hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars. Don't spend that money yet, though, because we have some things that that we are underfunded for. When the enterprise fund was created, it was a little bit underfunded, and we are still trying to catch up with some of that. We've had some things that that the general fund has had to supplement our waste management fund with. Um, we have a landfill in particular that we are, are continuing to pay to operate. It's a couple million dollars a year. That has been funded mostly by the general fund for the past few years, and we would like to try to get that over to the, the uh, waste management fund eventually. We have some equipment capitalization that we need to do. We are trying to get all of our waste management equipment on a 10-year replacement cycle. That's still above the about seven-year replacement cycle that most of the private haulers have, but we take pretty good care of our stuff, and we think we can squeeze out a couple more years. 
We have a reserve fund that is way below what it should be right now. Our reserve is less than a half a percent. So, you know, we really need to work on beefing that up. Right now, our, we have a, a policy of when carts wear out and they have some age on them, people have to pay for a new cart. At some point, we would like to at least consider the option of having cart replacements on a, we pay for it all. Um, that's not a definite, but it is something that we need to consider. And we have some recruitment issues right now that we are, are trying to work on. And um, believe it or not, it is very, very difficult to find qualified truck drivers. We are working with the Human Resources Department now to try to develop a program where we will in-house hire people, train them up to get a CDL license, and and then we'll actually pay for their licensing. We think that will help a little bit, but we also know that the city of Norfolk had similar problems, and they, within the last year, have increased the pay for their, their top-level drivers that are equivalent to our waste management operator threes and fours to where there's about a, a five to $7,000 gap between what we're paying and what Norfolk is paying. So, you know, we, we think we need to try to close that gap a little. So, with that, if there are any questions. We have Jim Wood first. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Phil, what is the impact of, the cost impact to the city, if any, if somebody puts trash in the recycle can? Do we get billed for that? We do not get billed for it right now. There's um, an assumed amount of bad waste, contaminated waste that will go in the blue cans. That That is always going to be an issue. We know that. And it's probably going to become more of an issue. The, the biggest consumer of recyclables is China right now. And they are getting much more stringent on what they will allow in. And if you talk to people like Michael Benedetto, they are paying huge fines for shipping contaminated goods. Um, China is actually opening pallets when they, when they arrive at the docks. And if there's too much contamination inside them, they're either putting them back on the boat or they're charging extra money for them. So that may become an issue in the future, but right now it has not. So, well, that, that, that kind of leads me. I was at a social event this weekend, and I talked to somebody who worked for the city of Newport News, and he works in the waste management division there, and he talked about their tipping fees, and it seems like their tipping fees are significantly less than, than what we're projecting here. And, and I'm curious mm -hmm. as, as to that. And then... There was another thing interesting this morning. I was reading about the um, the smart city initiatives, and they talk about how garbage trucks are are following certain routes and and detecting whether or not cans are full enough to be picked up, and then whether or not they should deviate their routes on different days. Which which was kind of an interesting thing to me, just trying to figure out if that could actually work in a city like ours. But um, it, it was just kind of a fascinating thing where they where they weighed the the different cans, saying, well, maybe this street's uh, is once every two weeks, but this street needs to be twice a week or that sort of thing based on the volume. But but I'm curious is why, and apparently Newport News does something like that, um, why, why is their tipping fee so much less than ours? I, th I think it's their landfilling costs that are that they have over in that, that area. Well, they, They're apparently just they have cheaper. a regional landfill that they use over there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah it's, it's cheaper. Several counties use that. Yeah, it's cheaper landfilling. And there's nothing that we can do to. I I can't make Sipsa's cost any cheaper. They ha Sipsa has a lot of capital costs, and and um, you know they Sipsa has done a lot of things to control their costs. I think they have other things they can do to lower some of their costs, but I don't know that we'll get down as low as what they are in so the court news. Issue. Okay, thank you, Shannon. 
is um, two questions. One is the um, contaminated waste. Is that at the 25 percent? I noticed that most RFPs kind of have that cut off at a 25 percent contaminated waste. That, that's there. what ours is uh, as part of our contract. But, you know, hopefully we will never approach that number. You know, I think we're always going to be far less than that. Got you. And you, thank you. And you, um, you mentioned the, the the challenge in hiring and getting good drivers and, and, and all of that. Have we ever put out an RFP to third party this and and, and make it a a, a non city employee function? Uh, no, we have not. But we did a massive study. We pulled over two hundred different. Uh, jurisdictions and took a look and <coughs> cost compared what they deliver, what the cost per ton, what the cost per monthly household was, what is the response rates once you go privatized. Uh, we also believe that one of the reasons why you're one of the cleanest cities in America is because we 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 don't un, we don't restrict. Um, what uh, the weekly pickup, uh, we, we encourage people to sort properly, both in the blue cans and the black cans. Uh, we pick up yard uh, waste uh, unencumbered. We do have restrictions on number of bags in our four foot by four foots, but we are the most lenient staff. We really get out there and do it. And if any of the council members call, we respond. We have we have loop back trucks uh, we have route supervisors that know everything about their street we have cameras in our in our vehicles that are able to look and see so when we actually pull up to a house we know whether that person really had his can out or not we have a private conversation with them when they sleep in and forget to get their cans out but we don't have dumping in parks we don't have dumping on the side of the road when that happens that's almost a rarity and it's reported and we go get it and so I know that we could probably chase a few dollars on the end, but the cleanup and the backtracking and trying to pull it out of your parks, it would be so much more expensive. And having come from Prince William County and know what the cost personally up there is, and having done a massive spreadsheet by uh, both management services and waste management to determine that, um, I fully believe that you have the, you have great control over your waste management stream right now. I'm not questioning and I will, the quality. And, I just meant if it's yeah. really challenging to get the, the personnel, maybe that's yeah. an answer. And I, I would also say that over the last five or six years, through just efficiencies in routing, efficiencies in equipment purchases, and extending the hours that, that our operators are working a little bit, we have reduced something like about 40 positions out of our waste collection staff. Okay, we've got Jessica, then John Moss. This, what is the weight, the average wage on the CDL drivers right now? Do you know that number off the top of your head? Uh, if you, you know, we, we have pay ranges. Right. Our, our highest levels, the starting. waste management operator fours, for the most part, they're they're making somewhere around the forty thousand dollar mark. If you get down to the threes, they're about five to ten percent less than that. The twos and the ones are are a little bit further behind. And that. You're saying Norfolk is five. To Norfolk's 7, five, more. about five thousand more on uh, the waste management operator threes, and about seven thousand on the fours. The, the other question I had following up that is there a program through Votech to get kids graduating high school their, out of high school their CDO? Is that a potential avenue? I, well, that's something we can look at. I, I don't know whether there is or not. I'm just, I know. I don't know that there is right now, but it's something we can look at. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've been talking to a lot of people coming in the next couple of years who are graduating, and their challenge just with finding jobs is, I mean, I know a couple of people who have a CDL. It's a... I mean, 40000 isn't, you know, maybe the high end of what you want to make, but that's not the end of the world either, I mean, considering what jobs are paying now. Right. Yeah. And they're not on the road. They're home every night. Yeah. Right. And, exactly. and, you know, we have, we have this problem with drivers, but we have it with all of our skilled positions. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're having a lot of trouble with skilled positions. John? I'm just curious if when you compare the private sector, what 
you know, go up and look at the various people that are waste management or whatever, what are they paying? And when you discount for, they don't offer defined benefit pensions. They generally don't pay anything of family health insurance. When you look at the total compensation package, where do we line up relative to productive hour work relative to wage? I think that you have to, because obviously they should be having those right. same problems. Are they? And how, I'm just always interested how the private sector, who's having to hire that very same skill, and I do know that mm -hmm. because of you can't have a domestic violence conviction, you can't have a DUI, you can't have a felony conviction, or you can't get the CDL license. Well, all these things narrow down the market for the eligible population. So that's a problem for trucking companies. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they realize they can't always pass that cost on to consumers right. because their consumers won't pay it. So they have other things. So I just think we need to always be put things in the proper context and might have to look for things other than and, how they're solving those when they can't price the pass right. that price and, on. And we have done we have done a little bit of comparatives with the private sector. Um, some of them that really don't have much trouble are ones that pay incentives for harder work, more performance, and you know that's not something we're set up to do very well. I'd love to be able to get there, but you know, if we could do pay for performance on it, that would work great. My other question was, what is the normal bet? I mean, I think reserves are always critical because you never know when things are going to go. You can overdo reserves, obviously. Sure. But if you looked across your industry where it, the government is the provider, even the private sector is 3%, you know, generally, you don't see many people go over five for anything because right. size of capital. But what is, you know, what are we, are we, have, do we have a goal we're trying to shoot for? Um, You're not the answer I, here. I but think, I just, it, yeah, I think if you were to ask our finance department, they would, they would say, really, we need to be somewhere around 10 percent or more. That's um, so, but. What I do know is that half a percent is not adequate. I'm with you there. <laughs> and uh, to the point about uh, recycling, as many people follow the industry, that has really fallen on hard times, the value of recyclables because of the fall of commodity right. prices. I mean, the thing, prices have really fallen, and many of these places are not doing well. That's what happens with commodities. The landfill. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I just think we always need to... I think that I've always said that if you look at re recycling from an economic perspective, the blue cans are not a money maker. Um, so, and just like we're doing landfill versus burning recycle, because it it doesn't make money and it's a cost, and you just have to ask yourself at what point right. is the cost we're paying at worth the social conscience we think we're gaining when the result right. is there's no market for the recycled goods. And I know I know you have to look at that. You just can't make a decision today. You got to look over time, right. but. It does talk about we have to just make sure when someone says let's spend more money on recycling to really look at where the marketplace is on recycling. And right, right. now it's in a very right. not such a good place. And, and what I, the only thing I would add to that, and, and this is not an argument, I'm just adding to what you've just said, is that, that the way we pay for disposal of what goes in our black cans is a tipping fee per ton. The way we pay for what goes in the blue cans is based on a cost per household, and it's whether the can goes out on the street or not, and regardless of how much material goes into the can. So everything that we can divert out of the black can, as long as it's legal, everything we can divert out of the black can into the blue can is a cost savings on our disposal fee. I agree for today's methodology, but as the pricing of those values turn sure. out, the people who do that aren't going to live with losing money. And my last thing was, can you refresh us where we are with all this toxic waste that they're having to deal with, the liquid at the landfill that they have to draw down and dispose of that had a cost? Sure. Where Let do me... we stand with that, and how is that cost being distributed? Uh, yeah, that, actually... The, the leachate issue is almost solved, and it, it, you may recall that at one time the, the leachate was at about 30 feet in one of the cells and not quite as much in, in the other cell. And um, quite frankly, nobody knew because the SCADA system that had been installed at SIPSA had not operated for about 10 or 12 years, and and um, they 
for whatever reason, nobody brought that to the board to have it replaced or anything done with it. They were not pumping as much leachate out of the, the cells as they could have, and even what they could have been pumping out was not as much as they needed to pump out. So what they did was they went to a combination of raising the amount they were pumping out to get it to the maximum allowed, and then doing a pump and haul where they were actually hiring tanker trucks to come in and, and get, get the leachate and take it to different HRST plants for processing. So they've been doing that for a while and they will continue doing that for a while. They do have a new SCADA system that is being installed now. It will take several months before that's in. Um, they, they greatly overestimated how bad the problem was and it's not nearly as bad. It was never as bad as what they thought it was and that's why they've been able to get it pumped down as quickly as they have. They are now within legal limits so it's just a, a matter of maintaining those legal limits. Um, they have spent some money on doing that, but money that they spent was all in the current year budget. And um, I don't, John, do you know how much money they spent? Or do we have the final account? The project right now it looks, looks like it's going to be about $3.6 million. Where it was originally estimated that over $10 million. That's why I was asking. Right. One time there was going to be a charge back to localities, and that's oh. what I was asking. Right. It was scary. So I think so we're scary. through that now. Any other questions Thank or comments? You. Uh, to Phil and John, we've been talking about, you know, uh, the work of, of y'all's employees, and I would sit back and say that I get very, very, very few complaints about TANS being missed, and I think everyone at this table can sit back and say that because of the great job they do. And in addition, we have a pretty clean city because of the great job they do. So I say it on behalf of the council and the citizens, we are, your, your department is, does a first class job. We're very proud of them. Thank you. All right, uh, the next Cavalier Shores Residential Park and Permit Program. Ron, you gonna take this on? Sir, I've asked Rob Freeze to join me to give you a little bit of background. Um, this is uh, under your ordinances, item 1A. Uh, I will go over that, but first I've asked uh, Rob to uh, remind us about the program, how it functions, um, and its current uh, status. Thanks, Ron. Good afternoon. All right. In general, the, uh, this program has been around since the uh, early 90s. Um, it was originally uh, uh, where it's at right now. It, it basically goes from 30th Street and it stretches down to uh, Winston-Salem. Um, the restriction, as we know it now, it starts at 8 p.m. and lasts until 6 a.m. in the morning every day. Um, obviously, it's more, you know, more of a prevalent issue during a peak season than it is in the, in the wintertime. Um, we do enforce it. The parking management office does the lion's share of enforcement, mainly April uh, through October. And the police will also do enforcement on special weekends, heavy weekends, when they anticipate large crowds, and during the off-season. And here's kind of a current map as we know it. It's um, you know, obviously it's you're looking towards the east, the south end here, you know, to your to the right is Winston Salem, and it goes all the way up to 30th Street. And by and large, this has really been the mainly the limits since it since its inception, since the early 90s. It really hasn't changed much. I think maybe a few have come in here and there since then, but not a lot. The purpose of the program is, is pretty simple. Uh, really, it's you know, to uh, alleviate traffic congestion late at night, to protect the residents from excess noise. Um, you know, they're the only place in the you know in the, probably in the state that you know backs up to a you know a, a resort community or resort area. It tends to be pretty festive at night, and the uh, the residents you know want the quietness and the peace at night. So we have this program. Uh, it does, you know, protect them from those unwanted burdens such as loud noise and uh, loud radios and people hooting and hollering at all, at all nights 
at all hours of the night. The objectives when, for the RPP in general is, you know, what if you recall that map, you know, you can see most of these areas are very contiguous, like, like a, you know, a very tight area where you know, there's no leapfrog areas like your neighbor's in, but this guy's out, you know, you're in, but across the street's out. So we, over the period since the early 90s, we've maintained that, you know, we wanted to keep it kind of tight and contiguous. We wanted to maintain that program continuity. Um, one, one thing, you know, it eases enforcement. So, you, you know, as the enforcement officers were patrolling, they know where they're in and where they're out. But, but more importantly, more than anything, it's for the public to know, you know, where it is and where it's not. Because the last thing we're trying to do is really trap anybody. We try to sign it, let them know where it's at. And so when they're contiguous and tight that way, they have a reasonable expectation of knowing, you know, where they're at. And so that's kind of the idea of, you know, what we have maintained over the last 25 years. Uh, the policy in general, if you're, um, if you want to become a part of the program, you have to be located within a half mile of a parking meter. <clears throat> and if you're new coming in, we're asking at least 75% of the parcel owners residing in that neighborhood to agree. What we really didn't want is to create kind of a 50-50 situation where half the people for it and half from up against it. We didn't feel that that was a great policy for neighborhoods. We really wanted a strong support from the neighborhoods to be a part of this program. And when you do this, you know, we want the petition to explicitly state the reasons of and the why you're in, you know, what the program's about so they know everything. You know, the, you know the restrictions. You know the permit types, the permit numbers, how you get them. So that in, that includes you know in all the petitions that has gone out. And lastly, we definitely want. Again, I can't say this enough. Is that we want it to be you know the boundaries to be contiguous, so you know exactly where the area is. Permits in general, as you know it now, um, it's basically if you're a resident, you get four decals a year. They go on your car. Um, you can get two guest passes a year, two annual guest passes, and up to 10 temporary passes per week. And they basically have a duration of 72 hours. And then um, businesses are in, located within the boundaries of that district who have employees that work after 8 p.m. They're allowed in, and um, they pay about 10 bucks a month. You must be a pre-approved uh, business before that's allowed. You have to show us, you know, that you're a responsible business by giving us a business license before we allow you in. Um, here's just kind of a graph of previous violations that we had since what. Um, 2005. Um, you can see it's multicolored. The red graphs um, show that what the fine was previously, it was $35. In 2014, at the request of the Civic League and some stakeholders, they wanted to get a little bit more control in this area, and they raised the rates up to $70. Um, and some, in some cases, in some weekends, major weekends, you know, prior to increasing the rates, it was sometimes it might have been cheaper to get the parking ticket in the neighborhoods than to pay some of the going rates in the private lots, you know, depending on the demand. So that, that really helped a lot there. Do you tow or you just give them a ticket? Uh, the parking management office will give them a ticket. The police department has, is the only one who has the authority to tow. And sometimes what they'll do is during these major weekends, they will follow our guys, and when they see a, um, a ticket on the car, they, they will follow up with tow. Um, our stats show, in general, which is, I guess is good news, is that you know, um, the people who get these tickets, at least 80% of them have Virginia plates. So it's not a lot of folks out there who are, you know, tourists that are getting these tickets. It's mainly Virginians, and it's, it's very well signed. There's probably at least six, 700 signs in that whole area, so it's very well signed. And now uh, Ron will come and walk you through the, the new request. Thank you very much, Ron. We welcome you back. Thank you. Okay, um, Mayor, uh, Council, since uh, really probably in earnest since November, 
um, city manager's office, uh, SGA uh, office has been working with the Cavalier Shores neighborhood. Um, they are in a, a neighborhood that is eligible for the program as it exists today. Um, they're within the quarter mile radius of, of a meter. Um, the ordinance that you have this evening is requesting a defined area of the south side of 45th Street, um, the north side of 42nd, and then essentially from Holly Road to Ocean Avenue. Um, they did submit their um, request for uh, admittance to the program. They had 97 uh, uh, sign the petition, which is uh, well over the 75%. Um, they have included um, uh, two additional items that are not in the existing uh, ordinance um, uh, code as we have it. Um, they asked at the time rather than an 8 p.m. start be at 5 p.m. Um, and then that no employee uh, or business uh, permits uh, uh, be allowed in the program. Uh, that's pretty much the, the skinny of it. Uh, we did have, we do have some uh, concerns, um, mostly because of the consistency, the program uh, as it's been, as Rob described, um, uh, looking at its continuity, looking at its contiguous uh, uh, streets. Uh, we don't have a problem on the streets there, but it is the, the change in the time that can be precedent setting um, that perhaps other uh, neighborhoods might want the same time, that they then could have a ripple effect on, part, on what some of the benefits of the program are, which is we can have a balance of beachgoers during the day, uh, we have a balance of employees being able to, to use the program, uh, but then residents can still enjoy the quiet uh, evening. Um, so that's our only concern with that. Otherwise, we would support uh, their adoption into the program, Mayor. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Uh, one, one, yes, sir. Uh, so, so, so that is the main benefit of this RPP program is just what you said. I mean, that, that's why it was instituted. Um, well, from my understanding and, and um, having lived there a couple times now, uh, yeah, the balance between uh, the enjoyment of the public, uh, understanding that we do have limiting, uh, limited, a certain number of limited parking spaces, 7,000 uh, at the oceanfront, and so the, the streets during the day provide that, that additional capacity to handle um, beachgoers during the day, yes. Okay. Rosemary. So really the only business that is changing things would be the opening of the Cavalier, is that correct? Correct, or the redevelopment, yes, ma'am. <coughs> yes. And so does Mr. Thompson use this program for any of his hotels, or has he indicated that he's going to use it for? We've reviewed the uh, participants uh, for, that have the business permits, and no one from Gold Key uh, currently uses the program, no, ma'am. Do they have any intentions of using this program? They have not expressed that to us when we asked, no. And he has told me personally that he would sign a document saying that he does not intend to take you up on the RPP. So he'll sign a document that says yeah. he's not going to use his program. That is correct. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. City Council liaison reports. What do we have? We have none. That's good. Well, not good, but anyway, thank you. <laughs> City Council comments. Yes, ma'am. Um, Especially watching what Houston has gone through, and, and there, there isn't any scene that you see with the people suffering that they're not involved with their pets. You know, you've seen the people being rescued, and they've got their dogs and their cats, and, their, and there are a lot of people who would not leave their homes because they were not going to leave their dogs behind. And, and I think Norfolk has a shelter where they'll take their pets, and I don't think that we have accommodations for any of that, and it's kind of, you know, your your pets really are part of your family. They, they really are, and I think a lot of people are not going to leave if they have, they, I would, I would have a lot of trouble leaving my Charlie behind, and I, you'd have trouble leaving Sparkle behind, wouldn't you? Um, is I would really like for us to look at our shelters and to see if we can make accommodations for people to bring their pets if they have to go to a shelter for, for a storm. Can you let us know what's available down the road, please? We, we have something in place now. And I thought we had the Animal Control Center. Yeah, we, we've, got, we've got pet-friendly um, 
shelters, and we've been, Bob and I have been working on this family called Control Advisory Board, and he caught me cold, so I don't I don't I'm remember sorry. the exact oh, details. Didn't Harry Dizel, when he was on, have yeah. said, you know, is, we'll get Dave to give us an update yeah. on the facts. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, Great. So we do have it's it. Fine. But if, I don't know about maybe our citizens don't know about it either. Okay, any other comments? Uh, yes, sir. One, I'd like to get feedback from the Development Authority on the new conflict of interest procedures they put in place to avoid us having the kind of embarrassing situation that we had. I know they, they're doing something new, but I'd like to know what it is new that they're doing. Uh, okay. I, I didn't hear the beginning of your... The new conflict of interest review procedures that the Development Authority has put in place to avoid the error in judgment that you so that we don't have that embarrassing situation. Can I know there? I'd like to know what that is. Do we know? <coughs> we haven't had a meeting. Okay, we've got Dave. He'll get that back to us. Uh, I would think, I like. I think we would like to get a copy of that new executive order. I think that would be worth the council people looking at. Uh, last week, you know, we got the discussion on uh, <coughs> pension unfunded liabilities. I just want to let staff know I followed up, on, count my peers, I followed up on that because the unfunded liability this year is greater than last year. It grew by a significant amount despite the catch up payments. So I asked the staff if they could show us from the year 2000 to now how much the outstanding unfunded liability was in each year and how much the catch up payment was. And is that delta growing, or was that an aberration? But it, it looks like... Was that because of investment return? Well, I don't know, but I went back and looked at several bond reference, and uh, but my point is, even with the amortization, we're not reducing the liability. The liability has actually grown, and I just think that people should be aware of that because that has its own implications. If it's a trend, that may not be. That's why I'm asking for the data over time. Just want you to know. I was reviewing the HRSD initiative, you know, putting the groundwater back in, which I think is a good thing. And one of the things is it may be a $1 billion capital expenditure, which would show up in the HRSD rates. But there was the comment from staff that that wouldn't impact the city because HRSD collects it. That's true. But guess what? The city and HRSD shares the same people who pay it. So I think we need to be sure we understand from a customer point of view the total liability on citizens. It's not the liability on the city. I just thought that was something we overlooked. There was a recent article in the uh, Wall Street Journal talking about a sign of improving the economy was a significant reduction in SNAP benefits. And I'm just curious if at the city level we're seeing that same trend line in reduction in SNAP of participants. That should be something easily to get. And commensurate with that, when we get the October report or November of the five-year forecast, if the school could update us on the number of uh, students on free or reduced lunch, because uh, I think that would be helpful. And I noticed also that several communities, New York City is one of them, are taking an assessment, and this should be, I think should be regional, so not be something for the regional do versus just us as a city, are looking and said, if we had a like rain event in Hampton Roads versus just Virginia Beach, what would that look like and how would we respond? And one thing that got my attention was, even now, the sewer pump stations in Houston, this is an issue. So can we or does it make sense for that, that core infrastructure to make that core infrastructure truly waterproof? I know we're doing that for that system that's on Witch Duck Road. I mean, uh, Kennesville Road, that interchange, we're making that big thing waterproof. But over time, would we look at our most vulnerable pumping stations? And would it be worthwhile to make those waterproof and adjust them so even when bad flooding takes place, we're not injecting a fecal contamination into water and have a public health risk. That might take a long time to do, but that could be a long-term preventative thing, and it's only limited infrastructure, and there may be federal grants for that. That's all. Thank you, John. Yes, sir, Ben. Um, uh, this past uh, Wednesday, uh, we hosted doc Dr. Mark Hoyt uh, from North Carolina State University, who is the architect of the North Carolina Next Generation Network, which is a public-private partnership between Duke University, North Carolina State, UNC, and Wake Forest and their corresponding municipalities, um, along with a private internet service provider. Um, the program or consortium that they've built down there has been wildly successful, attracting three new internet service providers in the past two years. Um, and we believe uh, working uh, regionally with our 
uh, neighbors, uh, both on the south side and the peninsula, that we can create a very similar consortium here, uh, which is the genesis for uh, Dave Hansen's presentation on our Go Virginia application. And so it was a wonderful meeting. It was attended by all 17 municipalities, um, and everybody seems very enthusiastic about it. Keep up the good work. We're good, proud of good you. Good job, man. Thank proud you. of you. Other comments? I've got, yes, sir. Yeah, one, uh, one quick thing. Uh, I was at lunch the other day on Cleveland Street at a very famous hot dog place a couple <laughs> of us have hung around. And we walked out, and there was a huge pothole in front of the place. And the gentleman I was having lunch with took a picture of it, sent it in, and Mr. Hansen, it was repaired the next day, you know, by the, uh, the photo thing. So I just want to give compliments. You said 10 on your side, it's Bobby Dyer on your side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions, any other comments? I, I've got to give a shout out to uh, the Rock and Roll Half Marathon. Um, I was there both mornings early. I had to start it, and I even participated in the 5K. But my point being... To go by and see uh, what it takes to get this thing going early. As a matter of fact, I saw your, your wife in the command center, <coughs> in the rescue squad. Good at commanding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she's wife. listening on that one. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe I hope she isn't. But uh, to see what the job the police were doing, EMS were doing, public works was doing, Sentara, they set up a triage in uh, Station 14 where that they can take them there prior to going to the hospital if it's not life-threatening, um, and then the volunteers. You know, it, I, could, I could not believe the number of ambulances involved. I could not believe the number of police officers involved, the volunteers involved, and it just appeared to go smoothly. So uh, a shout-out to everybody that participated in that. It was, it was a first class. So, so she told me also that Homeland Security was there evaluating our response and said that Ooh. we had above... What, we'll, what others we'll, have done. I'll take it a step further. I was talking to, regrettably, the ownership of this race has changed numerous times since it started. But the first time that this res race came here, we have a volunteer rescue squad. And they said, hey, volunteers aren't going to, yeah, this, this <laughs> isn't going to cut it. The guy that owned the race came to me that evening after the race and said, you, we're taking you as a model and going to take it across the country on the way our volunteers uh, did, did the job. And now, as Jim, I had heard the same thing, what they're doing with the triage and so forth is something that's the model for the race. And this race is international. It's not just across the country. It's overseas as well. But thanks for bringing that up, Jim. Great point. Yes, sir. Mayor Sessom, I forgot one thing uh, in my comments, and the main point of the comment was to thank uh, City Manager Hanson and uh, Norfolk City Manager Doug Smith uh, for attending uh, the meeting. I'll thank Hanson. I don't know. I'll thank Doug Smith. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do the agenda review, please. All right, under ordinances and resolutions. Uh, Anybody have any comments on any of them? You got my abstentions? I got your abstentions. Thank yeah. you, sir. Lewis, I think we'll probably have to hear 1A. Okay. <laughs> oh, I wanted to ask a question about the Adopt a Drain program. Um, Jessica, I think it's a, it's a, it's a lovely idea. Um, and, but there was mention in there about the the budget impact, but we didn't know what it was. Dave, do you have any idea? I thought we already had it. No, the, when I talked to um, Rod about it, he said that they were including that, that they would be brought back to council if there was a budget impact. River now, so you can get on your drain thing if you do something. Yeah, I knew we did have something now, somewhere. You can get yeah, on your drains, but that is unique to the Liver Haven okay. watershed. All right, great. I've seen there, them whenever. They, there's, there's not, this would just be advising staff to bring, create the program. And just for council's information. Determined to meet expectations, but no, I don't have a budget line item, and you know, it would be something that we would want to. Um, utilize our stormwater fees to, or general fund fees to support, depending on what that program is. I can't give you an answer right now. Do we, we need to work on it. Do we, should we know what, what the program is? 
to have an idea of what it's going to cost before we vote on it? Well, I can't I can't that commit funds before. without coming back to you. Well, well, I believe for Jessica said she doesn't want any funds spent. She just would like to go this route. And that's your intent? Well, my intent with the resolution was to give direction to staff to come back to Good. council with okay. that information. Great. Great. I want to discuss 9E. We can just discuss it here. I don't know how long we have for this. We can discuss it outside. But uh, I went back and just used one as an example of planning. Planning under-executed their budget. This is on page one of two under nine E. It'd be page one, two, three, page four of the actual agenda item. And this, this gives, I can give other examples as well. But so they under-executed their budget by one point three million dollars. And so here is something that is a very small amount of money, one hundred eighty-six thousand six hundred fifty relative to one point three million. Not a huge amount because they consistently over time under-execute. So I know one of our goals was to look for op opportunities where we could to find money that could, additionally money that could go towards flooding. So if people consistently under-execute their budget over time, and the amount being asked here is for something like building renovations, I don't know why in the budget that we just appropriated that they will under-execute they can't absorb that cost and why those money shouldn't be. Re I understand the projects aren't new. I understand all that. This is the principle of people consistently under execute and we take money that could be held still in reserve with the surplus and let's see if they in the end don't under execute. We can fix those at the end. This is, this is to me uh, not the way we should project. And then you can look at uh, radios, $2 million for radios. Now, you could say in an enterprise account, any money that they don't execute, I think we probably put in their surplus account. I would think that's probably true. That's where that ends up. So if we didn't do this, they would have $2, $2 million in their surplus account, and that we would then be appropriating stuff rather than carryover. The books would have closed. We would come in forward with the request to spend $2 million of the surplus versus a carryover from the prior budget. I just think, I just have problems with the mechanics by which this is done, and some of these amounts are just really small. And here's one, the Convention and Visitors Bureau. When I read the description, this is anticipation of the impact during the construction of the arena. Well, I don't know about you, but I think we might be a long way from when that starts. <laughs> And so, therefore, why are we moving money when the events that would cause the expense to take place haven't even been consummated? But yet we're moving the money in advance of the requirement. And I'm just going by what I got from staff. So I just have some concerns about the fidelity. I'm not voting for this, not because I don't. I guess I could, could divide legally the vote into a lot of different votes because I can do that. So 90, you're voting no. No, that... because I, and not because I'm not in favor of the police pieces, but this is like an omnibus bill in Congress that people talk about where they throw everything in the kitchen sink in there and people don't want to vote no for something, so they vote yes for things they shouldn't. So knowing that it's going to pass, I'm voting no. But if people prefer, we can go through and no, I don't want to go there you. and vote on each item. No, 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 no. no is on 9E, though. Is that right. Right? Yes, that's okay. that $3 million. Yeah. But right. this is bad management. Okay, so Mr. Vice Mayor, if I'm going to... If you'll double check me, 1A, we will hear. 6, I'm abstaining. 7B, I am abstaining. And 7E, I am abstaining. And then 9E, no for Mr. Moss. Are we on? Six, you're abstaining. 7B, you're abstaining. 7E, you're abstaining. And, okay. 9E, in order. Okay, ma'am. I know you said that. Mr. Bradley was up there to make comments. Did you want to make any particular comments on any of these that, that were highlighted? Is there a... No, I was just going to say, just generally, um, part of the carry forward, part of the issue is we do control by categories in the budget. So we control by salaries and fringe benefits, and we also control by operating accounts. So in this case, this is money that would be carried forward in operating accounts. So there may not be as much money there, and part of the surplus that's there in each of the years is because this money wasn't spent. 
And, uh, you know, for instance, the um, trolleys, they're not going to spend that money unless, you know, the arena does go under construction. So, you know, the departments are aware to spend the money just for the purpose that's at hand. So, you know, one of the things I, I commented to Mr. Moss because he asked some questions today, one of the things that we're really clear about, you know, that the carry forward process is not a substitute for the budget process. You can't carry forward money because you had surplus funds. You can only carry forward money because there, for some reason or another, couldn't be encumbered or expended during the year by contract. And they have to show to us what the extenuating circumstances were before we would even recommend it to city council. If I could, Paul, the requirement for this shuttle specifically didn't exist in the prior budget year because there's no consummated agreement. So there's no requirement we're carrying over and there's no expectation of requirement carrying over. In the budget year that we're in, there is no current requirement because there is no consummated arena deal. So in neither case for the test you just articulated, does that item pass? And their surplus was $984,492 against which $191,000. So if those are your criteria, we're just not consistently applying the criteria you just articulated. Okay. Uh, there, there is a slight modification to 1B, uh, and it's uh, on line 44, and I just passed the, the, those out to you. Uh, instead of it saying uh, of the date of the bill uh, in that uh, paragraph, it's past the date of the bill is the wording. So, okay. All right. Planning. Planning items. Item J1, Clarence E. and Doris Bryan and Cindy Feldman, Lynn Haven, Mr. That, Wood. That's fine. <coughs> Item 2, Ocean Bay Homes, Inc. and Pat, Pat Patricia A. Martino, uh, Beach District, Mr. Earn. Let no issues with that, Mr. Vice Mayor. Consent, please. Item 3, 5073, Virginia Beach Boulevard, Bayside. I'm fine with it. I'll be abstaining on 2 and 3. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, item 4, New Millennium Senior Living Communities. I'm fine with it. We have something. Did some, you see that Ty Solomon letter? To, um, um, defer it. Ask for deferral. You want to see that? Yeah, I did. I, did. I didn't see that. Todd Solomon of the Short Ride Coalition. I'm Virginia. assuming he's referring to the community, not him personally. I wanted to hear what he had to say before I said yes or no. Are they going to be here to speak? Yeah, no, that's why. I mean, it's, I'm really not going to know. Well, we'll see if they're here. Okay. Let's keep it on consent, yeah, unless we're speakers. All right. Uh, item 5, Outdoor Resorts of Virginia Beach uh, Condominium Association, Prince Sam, Ms. Henley. Item six, Freedom Properties, Virginia Beach LLC, Lynn Haven. Yeah. So I, would. I, I met with the applicant and um, and their engineer, and um, re reading through the verbatim and, and the issues there, it seems to me that they've addressed all of the issues. I also understand the applicant tells me there are several letters of support that didn't find their way into our package, which I'd like to see if staff can get us those before the meeting starts. Um, but but I'm I'm supportive of it, and it's. So if there's nobody speaking on it, and my understanding is the opposition isn't opposition anymore. So. I understand that. I believe it is. Because you're okay. So I'm okay with it. Yeah. Okay. Seven, uh, Myrna Holdings LLC and Allen D and Patricia A Young Lynn Haven. Yes. Okay. And, and going back to six, when I say I'm okay with it, I'm not okay with. The recommendation. I'm okay with supporting it. Approval. Approval. 
Yeah, the recommendation is denial. Yeah. And I disagree with that. I'm okay with supporting it. So you, you're in support? Yes. Is that okay. Item 8, Franklin Johnson Group Management and Development, LLC, Virginia Wesleyan College. I'm fine with it. Uh, there were some people who objected uh, at the, I believe, at the Planning Commission. And they may be <coughs> if they are or why. Yeah. Well, here. I'm voting no, and I want to explain my vote after we have the consent. I'm, I'm also voting no on 8. We do. Okay. Then we'll pull it. All right. Item 9, Sacred Daggers, LLC, and Gibson Enterprises, LLC. Rose Hall, Shannon. Consent, Your Honor. She said fine. Yes, sir. And she says, you are honor. Your Honor. <laughs> not just, not, not just hey, Lou. It's Your Honor. How about that? Huh? Okay. <laughs> Sounds like we might hear a few of these tonight, yeah. which will be just fine. Ooh. Okay. The chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-3711A, Code of Virginia, as amended for the following purposes. Publicly held property for discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for the public purpose or of the disposition of publicly held property. Where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A3, Beach District, Kinsville District, Princess Anne District, Lynn Haven. Personnel matters, discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees of any public body pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A1, Council Appointments, Council Sports, Commissions, Committees, Authorities, Agencies, and Appointees, Executive Director of Sister Cities of Virginia Beach. have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Call the roll, please. Mrs. Abbott? Aye. Mr. Davenport? Aye. Mrs. Dyer? Aye. Mrs. Henley? Aye. Mrs. Kane? Aye. Mrs. Moss? Aye. Aye. Mrs. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Wood